Hey everybody, hey I just wanted to do another video uh, for you guys. I'm not sure how long I'm going to make this one. It might turn into a teaching video. Um, something has really, really stirred me. Uh, there's been some scripture uh, that I've been reading and um, hearing and listening to. And then uh, the other day, actually it was just yesterday, I was uh, driving somewhere to the bank, I think, or coming back from the bank, and I was listening to a sermon, and the sermon was on Romans 16. And I've been listening to Romans, and I've been listening through 16, and I've been listening through um, the whole book of Romans, the whole letter uh, from Paul to the Roman church. And um, it was on probably one of my favorite topics, um, the scripture was on one of my favorite topics, and that topic is unity. And uh, ever since I started in ministry, uh, ever since I started going to church, um, ever since I began to know Jesus, unity has always been on my heart. And it just doesn't seem right. The way that I see unity does not line up with the way I hear about unity in the church or the way I see unity in the church. And um, for years, uh, so we're talking, well, 11 years since I've been saved and in Christ. And I would say, um, well, it's eight years in ministry and, um, and then nine years in um, like a solid church type without backing out of it, you know. And I've never, ever witnessed um, unity in person as I see it in the Bible. I've, I've yet to, to see it. I saw some very, very close glimpses. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I am uh, very active and love College of Prayer International, by the way, is because I get to worship and seek the Lord and minister alongside of my brothers and sisters from all over the world cross-denominational through every different denomination and some people don't even have denominations like myself but somehow we find the common denominator of the Holy Spirit our love for one another through Christ uh, that we get along that things do not become issues in the midst of our worship and even in the midst of our friendship so I was listening to this sermon and the sermon I was listening to uh, comes from a church who is very 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 strict on context uh, they talk about context all the time in all of their sermons but this sermon was a little different as I was driving I was listening to the pastor and he was he was actually preaching I'm just gonna go to the scripture right now I'm gonna read it to you and then I'm gonna tell you what the Lord said to me uh, it was Romans 16 and the scripture was this Romans 16 17 it says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause, dissent, cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. That was the scripture. But then the next sentence says, For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So this guy read that, and he started to, what we would call, um, expound on that. And he really, um, he really disappointed me. But I can honestly say it's probably 99% uh, of the teaching that I hear when it comes to this kind of stuff. So he went on to tell the story about how uh, how it's it, it, it's really difficult when you have uh, as a pastor when you have people in your church that are uh, very divisive that always have something to say about the way things are going and that they're always trying to draw people to their side in the midst of an argument and that and it got me thinking it got me thinking about my time uh, early when we had a building and and people to look after and a specific group of uh, people or a flock uh, to to look after and I thought about that and I was like you know yeah I do I get it there were some people 
um, in there uh, that were always causing division. Uh, two major people in that uh, group of people caused a huge division. Actually, three people, uh, but two of them. One is in state prison and has been there for quite a while, and the other one has completely walked away from their faith, drinking and drugs and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So obviously they weren't sent there from the Lord, and we were way too immature uh, to pick up on what was going on, but it caused a lot of division. So I can understand where he's coming from. But as he began to preach and as he continued to preach, he talked about at their church uh, where, where um, they have planted a church in this specific town. They, they have a very big church, a lot of people coming there. And he said, have you ever noticed the people we have out in the parking lot? And he said, they are there for security reasons and to help you park but they're also there to remove things from your windshield because we constantly have competition and other churches putting things on people's windshields, events and, hey, come here or do this and do that. And we are taught to remove them, not to confuse you with the teachings that you hear here. See, we guard our flock here. We don't want people from the outside coming in. We don't want to put confusion and division within the flock. It's not of God. As a matter of fact, let me read this scripture. And he went on to this scripture here. He went into Proverbs 6. And he says, as a matter of fact, God detests it. He hates it. And he says, Proverbs 6, he says, listen to this. He says, uh, here we go. Beep, 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 dee, 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 Okay. Proverbs 6, 16 is where he went. He said, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination uh, abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And then he went on to say, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies. But listen, guys, this is what he said, and one who spreads strife among brothers. See, God hates division. As a matter of fact, God hates when people come in and break up his body. Well, as I was listening to that man, and I was thinking about what he had said, something didn't sit well within my spirit. And I was like, wow, Lord, like this, this sermon is like rubbing the hair on the back of my neck. What could that possibly be? And as I sat there, I was thinking back to the beginning of my ministry, back when I was just very innocent and read the Bible and said, wow, the Bible says a lot of cool stuff before the church got to me, before I got to hear other people's opinions, before I got to hear the indoctrination of churches. But Jesus says this in John 17, verse 20. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word. He's talking to us. This is the Apostle John or John the Apostle. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, and they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved me. See, my very first public uh, community sermon was exactly on that scripture. It was in a community that had 12 churches, but never got together as, as, as one. I remember saying when, when Paul wrote the letter to the church in Ephesus, it was the community, it was the town of Ephesus, it was the believers in the region of Ephesus. He didn't write it to a specific small group of people within the body of the believers, he wrote it to all of the believers. See, I believe when Jesus says, see, I take this word for what it is, and I believe when Jesus says, I do not ask 
on behalf of those alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word, that they may all, all inclusive. See, the problem I have with that guy's sermon and the problem that God has with that guy's sermon and the problem that God has with you if you are preaching about unity and division within your own body but not including the context of that scripture see when Paul was writing to the church of Rome when he was writing to those in the Roman church he was talking about people coming into the whole body of believers in Rome and planting different teachings to lead people away from following Christ. Did you know that in America we have 200 separate, at least 200 separate, just in America, denominations? Denominations. Do you know why we have denominations? Because at one time somebody decided that they did not like a specific teaching or they had a better teaching and decided to divide the body somewhere and start their own movement. And then further down the line, in those two movements, somebody didn't like something and they divided. And somebody didn't like something and they divided. See, the Bible is very clear about false teaching and about uh, divisive teaching and teaching anything other than Christ. Actually, it says if anyone brings a gospel other than Christ, may they be accursed. It says that if one is sinning or in, in your um, midst or in your congregation that is preaching uh, a teaching opposite or other than what Christ was teaching, is to get rid of them. Get rid of them. Call it out. Not split off and have many people follow you. See, when Jesus was praying for unity, he meant all of us. All of us. See, I'm so blessed right now, and I'll tell you why I'm blessed. Let me read something here. Uh, Proverbs 6. I'm excited. I always love when, when the Lord speaks to me. No, not Proverbs 6. How about Psalm 133? That's what I really wanted to read. I was just seeing if you guys were paying attention. Let me read this to you. Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. Of, yeah, it says in my book, the New American Standard Version, it says the excellency of brotherly unity. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. See, I'm blessed. I not only have friends that are Baptist, Pentecostal, Alliance, Free Methodist, United Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopal, Catholic. I have all kinds, all kinds of friends from all over the place. And I get to worship with them. I get to go places with them. I have mentors that are from different denominations. I have mentors that have no denomination. See, there's a blessing in seeing the full council. The issue that I have is when you, what are you guarding? your people from? When are you keeping them from something bad or hindering them from getting something good? See, the problem with the division, the 200 different uh, divisive denominations, is they're all missing something. And if we keep our people stuck in our doctrine, not only will they get the sum of which is right, but they're getting the sum which is wrong. And we don't ever let them divide for themselves or decide for themselves. And as a matter of fact, when someone leaves a church, immediately people say, oh, they've fallen away from the faith. 
Now, while I believe in community, in a community of people, I looked it up earlier, it's on my phone, so I'm not going to take it down, but community is a gathering or a group of people with like beliefs or similar beliefs. Okay? Unity is having, like, in the upper room of one mind. See, while it's okay to have community with people who are of similar uh, like-mindedness, because I have that. I have a group of people that I chill with that we see almost everything the same, but we challenge each other a lot because we're very zealous on what we believe, and God has revealed many things to us. But see... I also cross those denominational lines. I also cross those race barriers. I worship with white people, black people, Native Americans, Chinese, people from Africa, people from Europe, people from Canada. Yes, even Canada. See, the problem with preaching division and unity and then making it sound like, you know, if anyone in this little group divides us, you're in sin. Um, but we need to all get along. You're really missing the whole context of Scripture. Of Scripture. It's all about getting along. It's about uniting. It's about having the power and the force of the Lord Jesus Christ that lives in us. Building a church upward to heaven and outward through our physical bodies that not even the gate of hell will prevail. God hates division. He hates it. Jesus himself, sa Jesus himself says a house divided will not stand. Do you think uh, Jesus' church is divided and it's, and it's not going to stand? His church isn't. But the church is what we call church. We just have to be careful with what we say. We need to be uh, more Jesus-minded and biblically based than denominationally uh, indoctrinated or opinionated. Not even I'm going to take the word denomination out because that already makes you guys cringe. Like, oh, how can he say something about my believers? I'm going to tell you why I can say something. Because if you have a group of believers that you call by a specific name and it's, it's uh, exclusive to those people, it's not the gospel. It's just not. And if they have to have a card or they have to be in, in, within your four walls to belong to what you call the church or the body of Christ, it's not the body of Christ. It's wrong. See, part of the systemic racism that we're dealing with in America today is the black church and the white church. See, in heaven there is no black church, white church. See, when we pray, uh, your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, in our white churches or our black churches, but yet we exclude people or we take off invitations from our people's windshield for, for fear that they just might think on their own or they might get an idea that is contradicting to your idea. You're in error. We are in error. I used to be there. I don't want that person speaking. Now, there's wisdom in that. I learned my lesson. I turned the floor over to a guy one time, gave him the microphone, and he started talking all about uh, being raped and all kinds of things about his genitals and I was like oh, give me the mic back not good not good so there's wisdom you know what I'm saying if you're looking for loopholes in what I'm telling you in the teaching you're probably guilty of probably clicky type uh, religion See, that, that was the problem with the Pharisees see the Pharisees didn't like Jesus because he was divisive He's going to take, if people go, if they said this, they said, if, if they start believing him and they go after him, we'll lose our place. See, the whole problem in America with this is it's a consumer church. I don't even want to call it consumer Christianity. Because to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, you can't be a consumer. 
and you blame people. Oh, look at that guy. He's church hopping. He's, he's, he's church shopping, going around. He's a consumer. No, you make it that way by selling your certain goods. Do you eat it? If you don't like Chinese restaurant, do you eat there? No. Do you ever try it? You go in once and try it and you leave, so it's your fault. See, here's the problem with sharing believers and being unified. We don't believe, here, this is going to hurt, it's going to ouch, but we don't believe God's big enough to provide for all of us. See, if I'm the pastor of a specific church and I need 800 people in my congregation to pay my salary, I can't let 10 people go visit somewhere because I might not have a job. That's not even biblical. See, that's the problem right now with America. We're too worried about our program. We're too worried about paying for our building. We're too worried about paying for the salaries. We're too worried about losing our job. We're too Pharisee-like. This cat here, um, I'm this close to sending him an email. I didn't give his name, so I'm not calling him out here on uh, in the public or worldwide or whatever but sending him an email telling him he's in error for preaching that as if Paul was talking to his 300 people in a town in somewhere in United States. Of course, it's not good to be divided. It's not good. There's two of us that live in this house. Shane and I live in this apartment. My son comes to visit every once in a while. Am I saying that it's good for us to be divided? Of course not. It sucks in here when we're divided. Unity is the way to go. But to mention, for me to say, hey, you and I need to be on the same page, but who cares about the rest of the world would be an error, be ridiculous. And that you'll never hear that coming from our from our mouths. See, we want to get along with everybody. We want to have the common goal. The common goal is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to equip other believers to do the same to make disciples, to go out and baptize people, right? To pray for the sick, to raise the dead. See, that's what we're trying to do. And that's the issue that I had with that teaching. And the Lord really kept showing me, was showing me like, yeah, like this is not what I like. Not what I like. As a matter of fact, um, he showed me this. He said, it says to keep, the guy said in his sermon, he said, keep your eye on those who cause cause division, those who are seeking to divide. And immediately I started thinking about the Wesleys. Now, A.B. Simpson, from what I understand, didn't want a, a denomination. But I started to think about those people that stepped out and said, no, 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 I don't want to do it this way anymore. Do it my way, because this is the way Jesus wants to do it. You know, I've heard it said many times. You've heard me say it many times. Uh, I've heard it said, and I've said this, but I don't always agree. I agree, but I don't agree with the timing. I've heard it said many times, if it's new, it isn't true. And if it isn't true, it's probably new. Okay. I kind of agree with that. But what do you consider new? See, I consider new anything outside of this Bible is new. Right? I don't consider anything after 1926 when my denomination was formed is new. No, your denomination's new because your denomination doesn't exist in that Bible. Well, my beliefs and that what your beliefs are one thing. But others have other beliefs. You know, here's the crazy thing is, I've heard this uh, mentioned many times recently in my conversations. And it just and it makes me grit my teeth when I hear someone say, well, the Bible says something different to everybody. There is no set meaning to the Bible. It just means something different to everyone else. Like we take out of it what we want to take out of it. Well, Well, let me correct you with that. You're right where it says the Bible says something different to other people. But the meaning doesn't change. What they intended to say doesn't change. The application to everybody is different. 
But when it says, don't have sex with someone else's wife, that's what it means. So, you can't change that. Uh, when it says, um, not to lie, you can't change that. It doesn't mean, well, don't lie to certain people, but lie to other people. See, when the Bible says to love one another, love your enemies, pray for your enemies. It doesn't say pray for certain enemies. Well, what does that mean to me? Well, my enemies are like mm, people who are in the Middle East. They're my enemies. But my neighbor that I don't like, I refuse to pray for them because they're not really enemies. See, no, the Bible isn't left for your interpretation. The Bible's left for your application through the Holy Spirit. See, and the problem is when we get into a group of people that say, well, this is the way we interpret it, believe it or else, you can't have an open mind. It's witchcraft. Demonic. Do you know why we're failing as a church? Do you know why? Because we worry more about how many people are following us than how many people love Jesus or are following Jesus. Now let me repeat that again. We were worrying about how many people are following us instead of worrying about how many people are following Jesus or loving Jesus. They asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. And the second is just as important. I'll just paraphrase it because I have like 15 different versions of Bibles here. To love your neighbor as yourself. Done. See, if we could learn to do that, and we can't do that through a set of rules. See, if the law was sufficient, the law would still be in effect. Do we act lawless? Of course not. Romans 7, man. Romans 6 and 7. I think it's very clear. No, we don't go on sinning so that grace would abound. But, apart from grace, apart from love for one another, it's all crap. I don't care if you wear purple robes or green robes or tall hats or small hats or no hats. If you have pets in church or don't have pets in church. Here's what I care about. I care about helping one another. I care about the church down the street without a roof and you're sitting on $15,000 and you have 10 construction people in your church. That's what I care about. Why don't you send your people down? Why don't you put a roof on that church? Or better yet, why don't you tear all the buildings down, build one big building and all worship together. Then break into smaller groups and discuss, you know, uh, what you believe and what you don't believe. What I've found is this. It's not so much what people believe that's different. It's their levels of maturity. And their, their intimacy with Christ that changes. See, most people be that believe in the works and all that stuff are usually newer believers. Because their intimacy is not as great with Jesus. They haven't fall, fallen enough times in their works to realize that that will not get them where they need to get. It has absolutely nothing to do with Methodist, Free Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopal, um, whatever. You name it, okay? It has nothing to do with that. It's levels of maturity. So if you are a church that's giving people uh, spiritual milk all the time, how are they ever going to grow up? And if you're the guy that only has steaks, what if your people don't have teeth? How are they ever going to chew the steaks? See, we need one another. True unity. A lot of people say, you know, Dan, you're against the church. You're always speaking against the church. No, I'm not against the church. I'm not against Jesus's church. I'm actually not even against the people who call themselves church. I love them. I love you guys. I want everybody to be on the same page so that we can fight the enemy, which is evil. Right? Not the other people. Ephesians 6, we battle not against flesh and blood but of spirits and principalities and all those at work and lawlessness and all those spiritual things. 
How great would it be if every believer in the United States linked arms and said, I'm going to put all my beliefs aside except for my belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to sit here and not judge anybody and love God with all my heart, all my strength, and all my mind. And I'm going to love my neighbors. I'm going to love everybody who's here today. I will tell you, I've done a few community services where multiple churches have shut down and they've been extremely powerful. I've done a lot of College of Prayer uh, modules or events, whatever you want to call it, where there were many, many denominations there. Actually, the one we have in Lilburn, Georgia, has usually many, many countries, many denominations. We all come together and I have yet to see that place not light up with the fire of God. I've yet to see people not come out of there changed. Guys, this teaching's hard. This teaching's long. Uh, this teaching doesn't make sense unless you step back and look at the big picture. It's time we step back and look at the big picture. We start looking at the word. We start stepping out of the box that we've tried to put God into. Because he's not in there. He created the box. He, you know, he is the box. There is no box. All right, guys. I think I'm done. I feel the Lord saying, time to stop, Dan. You've said what I needed you to say. So, hey, be unified. If you have any comments, feel free to comment. Feel free to message me. And, um... Yeah, let's do this thing together. Let's be united as Jesus prayed all of us to be united. All right, guys, peace. Thanks for watching uh, this video from the Painted Soldier Ministry. All right, see ya.